You're such an asshole. Hello everybody, strap yourselves in because we have quite a lengthy video. A guy just wants me to merely explain what bonds are, that's all, and everything about bonds, and how does it work, and what's the yield of maturity, and all these other wonderful exciting things that you will totally score with a girl at a bar with. So take notes, young lieutenants and economists out there. We're going to go and talk into the interesting world about bonds. Um, let me get situated. Where do my notes go? Here's his, here's his bond. Oh, they're on the notepad. Never mind. Got a computer, some paper. All right. Let me get situated. There we go. All right. <clears throat> Jason writes, Hello, Aaron. I have another question. For this one, I would like a video. As usual, I'll keep it short and succinct. I'm interested in learning about bonds and going after some research on the internet, Investopedia, and YouTube. I get the gist of it, but not really anything in depth. Since you're a finance graduate and working in bank or worked in banking, I figured you would be a good person to ask. I'm wondering if you could do a bonds for dummy type of video. Can you also include the difference between bonds, fixed income, structured notes, strip bonds, and package strip bonds? What is yield to maturity? This one I really don't get after quite a bit of reading. And then if you plan to hold a bond to maturity, does it matter if the prices go down? As long as it doesn't default, will you get your par value? Or you will get your par value. Is that correct? Please provide a, a quote, pay value the money. Thanks, Chase. All right, so it's not that I didn't know the basics of bonds, but as you're going to find out, I'm like, God, oh, and it's been a while. I'm like, what, where's the one I had to look up? Structured notes. I'm like, what in God's name is that? And I looked it up. And then strict bonds, I'm like, I kind of, why did I think that's zero coupon? And then I'm like, oh yeah, there's this little thing about them. So even the old captain had to brush it off. But I can explain to you, let's, we're going to do a top-down view of bonds. And we're going to get into the details of them. Because as you're going to find out, bonds start off very boring and ho-hum. But then they can get very complicated and very diverse. So, all right, first thing, what is a bond? In order to stand by, it's all you have to know. The number one mistake, people think bonds, oh, stocks and bonds, bonds and stocks, mutual funds, oh my God. a bond is a loan. That's it. That's all it is. If you were to go lend your buddy, Steve, $5 for lunch at the, at the school, and Steve wrote an IOU, $5, signed Steve, that piece of paper you hold is a bond, all right? Uh, so not all, uh, all bonds are loans, but not all loans are bonds because a bond is an actual certificate you get, you know, like you used to get in the old days, like a stock certificate, you get a bond certificate. But just because it's a bond, that's just, oh, I got some bonds. Here's my proof of ownership that I'm entitled to this person paying me back. But it doesn't matter. The transaction is merely you lend money to somebody or something, and that somebody or something owes you principal and interest back. And the principal and interest, interest uh, that you are, he is to pay, or it is to pay back to you, is detailed on the details and the notes of the bond. All right? Now, usually bonds, as opposed to a loan, like for a loan, the largest loan you're really ever going to see would be for your house. The bank will lend you a quarter million dollars or three hundred thousand dollars for you to go and buy a house. You say, well, "Why won't they? Uh, why won't I sign bonds? Why don't they? I, I sell bonds." Say, well, you can, but it's 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 a one person transaction. It's for one piece of collateral, a house, and you're not a large corporation or a super rich individual. So the lending amount is not that much. So it's pretty easy. A bank has the money to lend you one person. A quarter million dollars, half a million dollars, whatever. So you usually get a loan. But let's say you're a large corporation like IBM or General Motors or you're a government like Argentina or the United States. You don't just write a, a loan to the taxpayer. All right? uh, IBM just doesn't borrow money from one person. Right? Now, there's some banks that are large enough, they might get a, a direct line of credit. Kind of, It's a loan too. So what they're saying is, okay, well, we need to raise $2 billion. IBM wants to borrow $2 billion to go and build a factory. Or the United States federal government wants to borrow $200 billion so they could pay all the single welfare mom horse. Well, there's no one person or bank that's going to give the United States federal government, let alone IBM, $200 billion or $2 billion. So what you do is you, you, you divvy up into shares, a bond. So a bond could sell for $100 per share per bond. Right? or maybe even up to $1,000. So you sell 
thousands, hundreds of millions, perhaps even billions of bonds, they're all valued at $100 each, maybe $1,000 each, to the public, available to everybody to buy. So you're not relying upon one lender to lend you the money. So you, you basically borrow from thousands, sometimes millions of different people, because millions of different people are buying, aka lending you the money, your bonds. All right? So that's it. There's no difference between a bond and a loan. It's just the, uh, I guess, the size, the unit by which you, you lend out the money. So everything you know about a loan applies to bond. I lent Jimmy $5. Son of a bitch, Jimmy better pay me back that lunch money uh, and interest of six tomorrow. All right? uh, I lent Farmer Joe $350,000 so he could buy his farm. That son of a bitch, Farmer Joe, better have a good crop this year to pay me the interest on $350,000, not to mention a little bit of principal, and it amortizes out over 30 years. All right. uh, I lent money to the General Motors Corporation, uh, and they said they were going to pay me 7% a year, and then after five years, they would pay me my interest back. Well, every seven years, there better be 7% interest paid to me, and then at the end of that five years, I better get the 10 or 20 or however many... Uh, bonds worth I, I bought from them thousands of dollars of principal back. Right? So just as you notice that there are different variables and ways and parameters by which you can lend people, entity, uh, or things money, so too are there as many variants of bonds. And you're starting to zero, uh, you know, strip bonds and this bonds and that bonds. There's convertible bonds, that signature notes. There's every possible permutation of bonds out there. Some bonds, you don't, pay, you don't get interest. You just get a lump sum of in, uh, interest and principal at the very end of the maturity, when the, the loan matures, the end of the lending period you agreed upon. Lending periods, a.k.a. maturities. Okay, you have a 30-year mortgage. Okay, at 30 years, your balance should be down to zero. You will have paid the bank back all the principal and interest. Sometimes it's a 15-year mortgage. Uh, student loans are, I think they just revolve and you accrue interest over time and you make interest payments. Um, <clears throat> lines of credit, there is no set. You renew them every year. So every way you could imagine to structure a lending agreement with someone or something, there's a bond out there like it. Now, there are two ever so general types of bonds. There are zero coupon bonds and they're just regular old coupon bonds. <laughs> they're just, they're, uh, and what the coupon is, coupon is just the interest rate. They call it coupon, it's interest rate, that's all it is. They're just getting cute with coupon. Uh, the coupon bonds are your standard ones that you're, you're used to right now logically. Okay, the lending period is X number of years, 10. And that company or gov government or person agreed to pay 5% a year, and at the end of the 10 years, uh, I get my interest or my principal back at the end of that year. Or I get 5% a year, plus a little bit of my principal back so that the final payment, the balance is down to zero after 10 years. So you can, do, you can amortize it, meaning lower the balance that way. The zero coupon bond, the only reason I bring it up is because this is what you all have when you go get your federal government, uh, your, your, your government bonds. You don't get an interest payment from the government. Uh, you buy a, a $100 bond for say $20 like you did back in 1980. And then 10, 20, 15 years later, you get $100. You take that bond into the bank, you get your $100. So the interest and principal are imputed or imbued in that last final payment. And that's a zero coupon bond. I mean, there's zero interest. It's just a lump of principal at the end of which there is some interest involved in there. And we're going to get to that later when we get to, to stripped bonds, which are slightly different, but it's the same kind of principle. So now that you understand that, I can explain that later on. Um, what else do I want? I already did that. Principal and interest. Oh, and then one final thing about bonds. Um, for the most part, bonds are secured with collateral. This is going to become important <laughs> because if you lend $5 to Jimmy over at the lunch line and that son of a bitch Jimmy didn't give you $6 at the end, well, what do you do? He doesn't have anything. You didn't, he didn't pledge any collateral or assets. So what do you do? Well, you do what the mafia does. You beat the shit out of Jimmy over on the playground. Well, now that's kind of frowned upon nowadays in today's modern day financial world. <clears throat> so what banks or lenders in general will do is they will secure collateral. 
oh, you would like you would like to borrow a quarter million dollars to buy that house on our 30-year mortgage plan. That's nice. You fail to pay us. Guess what? We get the house. All right. So what this teaches you, and it could be anything. It doesn't work that way with governments, by the way. Just to let you know. IBM doesn't pay it, corporations don't pay it. It's a little bit difference between an individual and when an entity doesn't pay. Uh, but usually there is some kind of collateral that could be collected that the lender will then take legal ownership of. They will sell it, get whatever money they can to pay off the remaining balance of the interest and principal of the loan. And if there's anything left over, that is given to the original borrower so they could go ahead and do that. Now, when it comes to... Uh, what we're most familiar with, and that would be a house, and I know most of you guys are familiar with it because you got repossessed on, you couldn't make your payments back in the housing bubble. Housing only goes up. Uh, you you uh, presented your house as collateral, the banks foreclosed, repossessed it, you all thought you were entitled to free housing. Uh, screw you, it wasn't your money that you borrowed, you borrowed uh, depositors' money. Banks repossessed the house, sold it, and if you're lucky, there was money left over. When it comes to corporations uh, and they can't pay back their lenders, that usually means they're in financial trouble. This is where they file for bankruptcy. And what happens there, and this is important to know about bonds, is that uh, the uh, company goes bankrupt and it is taken over more or less by the bond who owns it. The assets of the company are sold, either wholly as a subsidiary to another company or individually. This is where you heard corporate raiders where uh, corporations would come in and they'd buy the stock for pennies on the dollar. If you're, if you're bankrupt, your, your equity, your stock has no value. So these corporations would come in and buy uh, uh, companies for penny, pennies on, on the dollar. And then they would individually sell off these assets, uh, say for $7 billion. And then uh, the lenders only lent out five billion, so they would say, "Okay, we sold it for seven billion. We're paying you lenders off five, and now we get to keep two billion. I think it was not wasn't Michael Milken. Maybe it wasn't Michael Milken, but that was the corporate raiders. That's what evil Mitt Romney did, uh, which is the fault of the market not pricing assets correctly. In either case, the point is one of who gets the money first, and this is why bonds are considered less risky in general than stocks." If there is the case of bankruptcy, screw the shareholders. You guys own the company, you mismanaged it so badly, and I'm on the way, it ain't your money. So what the uh, bond entitles you to is that, okay, we're going to liquidate the company, we're going to sell its assets, sell whatever, and whatever funds are raised first, that money goes to the bondholders. All right? Hopefully you get all your money back. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes they can only liquidate the company and you get 80 cents for every dollar. That's where you get 80 cents on the dollar. And your bonds will then travel down to that price. <clears throat> uh, but sometimes, as in the case of corporate raiders, a lot of, lot of bondholders love corporate raiders because they go in to get a lot more money than they get, they're made whole and complete. But just to let you know that in the case of bankruptcy and why bonds tend to be a little bit less risky than stocks is that you usually will get some modicum of your money back. Um, unless you were flipping houses in Southern California or Las Vegas or Florida in 2009. Um, so that is that. Okay. Now, terms. Let's go over some terms here. You gave me this nice little sheet. I think Jason owns or he's looking at a bond here. Now, so there's a little bit of information. Maybe took some notes. I don't know if you could see that. There's some terms there. Let's go over these terms because then you'll kind of understand it. All right. The issuer is Bell Canada. Uh, so that is the, the borrower. They issued mean they sold bonds. And it doesn't mean sell bonds. It means borrow money from other people. You get bonds. We pay you back. So the borrower is Bell Canada. The coupon, or the interest rate, uh, and that's listed on the bond, is 3.35%. We're going to get to how interest rates change and what's the difference between yield and maturity and your coupon bond. Uh, your maturity is March 22nd, 2023. That means, I'm going to assume this is a standard bond where they pay 3.35% and at the end, boom, you get your cash. So they're going to pay you back uh, what it looks like $10,000. That's the, yeah, that looks like face value is $10,000. So it was issued at $10,000 per bond. So for every bond that you bought, you're going to get your $10,000 in principal back on March 22nd, 2023. Type bond, class corporate. QSIP number. QSIP is uh, the ticker symbol. 
of a bond. Like you don't when you make a trade for General Motors, you don't type in General Motors. I think you just type in GM. It's an acronym for stock. Stocks have acronyms. Bonds have QCIP numbers. So uh, you'll you'll go to your broker and say, I want to buy. I don't know. Bonds in uh, in Procter and Gamble, and they'll say, okay, there's and Procter and Gamble could have like, well, no doubt they do have multiple issuances of bonds. Corporations are always issuing new bonds every year. So, well, do you want that year? Do you want this year? Do you want the five year? Do you want the ten year? This one's seven. This one's five. What do you want? So you get a QCIP number. Uh, credit rating. If you remember, they have the credit rating bureaus like uh, Standards and Poor's and Moody's where they said everything was wonderful and rosy during the housing bubble and none of those mortgage-backed securities were, were low. They were all AAA. So this has a triple B rating, not too bad, not junk either. And you can look it up. Each of the credit rating bureaus have their own. Not too unlike you, me, in, in high school, you know, A, B, C, D, F. I was triple minus F back in my schooling days. Payment frequency, semi-annual. That means you get an interest, rate, an interest payment or a coupon payment every six months. Your currency is Canadian dollars. Uh, yield, <clears throat> this is the current yield you are getting on your bond. You say, well, I thought it was 3.35. If you bought it when it was originally issued, yes, you forked over your $10,000, you get uh, $335 per year in interest. Your rate of return is $335. But the nanosecond you buy that bond, it starts trading on the secondary market. And the price of the bond goes up and down for reasons I'm going to explain later. So this yield to maturity, which is 2.808, uh, that is not the interest rate you, original bondholder, who bought at 10000 per bond. This is for somebody else who is paying the current trading value of the bond which has gone up, and you kind of look, if you look at your sheet that you hold it right here, the current value of that bond is not $10,000. It's trading in the market for $10,254. I'll explain why it's more valuable now. Uh, but basically, if someone were to go and buy uh, this bond at its current market price, they would only get 2.8% is what that yield to maturity is. So the yield to maturity is for somebody at this moment in time who wants to buy your bond at its current price. The coupon is what the original bondholder, assuming you're at you, who paid $10,000 when it was first issued, what you're getting on it, okay? Because the price will change. So, so that's kind of a, an abbreviated difference. Face value, also called par value, that's um, what it was originally issued at, the $10,000. Price is its price, you go online, you look it up, or you type in the QCIP number, oh, there's the price. Changes just like stocks. Second to second, minute to minute. Exchange rate, I don't know why they provided the exchange rate. Uh, accrued interest, <clears throat> and I think accrued interest is um, interest that is accrued on the bond but has not been paid out yet uh, for that particular payment. Does that make sense? Yeah, that looks like about half of the 3.35. No, that isn't it. That's not right. Oh, that's right. It could only be, it could be accrued to that particular day. Looks like you're about three quarters through the payment period. So um, there is some accrued interest that has accrued on this bond that is due to anybody who would buy it from you. And so its current price, there we go, that makes a little, I was, like, I was missing half a percentage point there. $10,400 is what the current price of that bond uh, would be trading at. Um, so that's what you have there in front of you. All right, so those are the, the vocabulary terms. But again, if you understand how a loan works, you, you kind of already would be able to figure out their uh, common layman vocabulary uh, equivalent. The issuer is, is Jimmy that rat bastard who borrowed $5 from you. The coupon is the 3.35%, but you didn't charge them 3.35% per year. You charge them 20% a day because you're the mafioso of the play school. Uh, 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 elementary school playground. Maturity is March 22nd, 2023. Now it's tomorrow, you son of a bitch. Type bond, bond. Class corporate, no, little Jimmy. Little boy would be that. QCIP number, you don't have QCIP numbers in the grade school. Credit rating, depends, you know, is, is little Jimmy, is his parents rich? Or does does he like, uh, does he get like, uh, does he not have the brand new brand name shoes? He comes from the poor. Did you see his family shopping at Walmart? Man, his credit rating may not be that good. 
Payment frequency, you got a zero coupon bond with Jimmy. He's just going to pay you all back in one shot. Yield, yeah, that there's no market right now where you could get current price data for Jimmy's bond. Accrued interest probably be a buck, and that's maybe right. So it'd be the current price would probably be six dollars. So in theory, you could take Jimmy's IOU and you could sell it to Tina for six bucks. Yeah, Jimmy owes me six bucks. Here's his IOU. Tina would give you the six bucks, and then she'd go hunt Jimmy down for his for his five dollars and one dollar of interest. So that that explains the vocabulary. All right. Now knowing all that, there's how bonds should work and how bonds shouldn't work or when they don't work right in the perfect world you lend money to uh, IBM or the United States government or Amy's hair design shop you agree to whatever terms interest rates principal and maturity <clears throat> and it could be a bond or it could be a loan doesn't matter a bond it's just again a partial ownership of that bond issuance that that large loan they pay you regularly on time, your interest rates every six months. Sometimes it's quarterly, sometimes it's annual, sometimes it's never. It's not until the very end, like those zero coupon bonds. And then uh, the maturity day comes along and they pay you back all your principal. And you are happy, you've made your three, four, five, seven percent, whatever. Um, and that's what you wanted and, and goody two shoes for you. <clears throat> bonds don't work when the borrower takes the money and pisses it away, all right? Invest it foolishly, or it just has some really bad luck. And so I'm gonna go through three instances because they're the three most common bonds you're gonna run into because they're the three most common borrowers. You have corporate borrowers, <coughs> you have individual borrowers, and then you have government borrowers. I'm gonna go through three instances of where it did not go the way it's supposed to. First, corporate bankruptcy. Uh, choose any one of the Mortgage houses, banks, or, or not banks, uh, corporations, real estate developers, uh, back during the housing bubble. They borrowed $10 million. I ran into a bunch of real estate developers. They come to the bank, knock, knock, knock. Hey, Aaron Clary, can we borrow $10 million? Uh, why do you want $10 million of our depositors' money, which is guaranteed, by the way, by the taxpayer? Because we're going to build more McMansions. Really, according to my research and study, there's two years of surplus of McMansions right now and if I look at your financial statements you haven't even sold those yet oh but they're under contract and you would say no I'm not lending you the 10 million dollars but in comes old baby boomer fart boss McGee well, you don't know how to do this job I've known Jim since forever you should say we're gonna lend it to him anyway Jim's a good guy the economy's housing never goes down Clary you gotta understand that <clears throat> And Jim gets raided by the FBI later for uh, falsifying documents. Anyway, you lend the money to Jim's real estate development company. What does Jim do? Well, a couple of Jims I knew pissed it away on boats on Lake Havasu, girls, whores, booze, cars they couldn't afford, and houses. Some of them actually got to houses that would not sell. All right? So we let it out. Now, what you don't know about banks is banks just don't get money unless it's, they're getting bailed out. Money's got to come from somewhere. It comes from depositors. Depositors require some interest to be paid back on their loans. So banks have a cost too. So if Jim's real estate development company don't sell any of his houses, which he didn't, he can't pay us back. Now, we don't have the money coming in to pay our depositors the interest rate, not to mention employees pensions, all the other expenses and advertising and operations required with running a bank. So <clears throat> all of a sudden, uh, they can't pay. They, got, they, they issued this bond. They took a loan from us. They file for bankruptcy. All right. So what does the bank do? Well, the bank has the collateral. What's the collateral? Overpriced, shoddily built McMansions, of which there's two months, uh, two years supply, sorry, two years supply in the market that nobody wants to buy. And so the banks repossess the collateral. We lent out 10 million. We try to sell it for 10 million. You're not going to get 10 million. You find out you got to lower it down to 2 million. Banks decide to sit on it. Why? Because the Federal Reserve came and bailed us out. Larger point being, the value of that loan, we could view it as a bond went from 10 million plus whatever interest we would get adjusted for inflation and present day value. So say 10.5 million. We're gonna expect to net half a million dollars of profit on this loan. 
it ended up being an $850,000 loss. Or, I'm sorry, $8.5 million loss that you, the taxpayers, paid for. All right? So, that's an instance of a company going bankrupt. Same thing would be IBM, not IBM. <clears throat> What's a company that... Blockbuster decides to expand in the great suburbs, and also Netflix comes along and obsoletes their technology. Blockbuster can't pay you back, so your bonds go down to zero, and um, Blockbuster is liquidated, and if there's any residual money, just like they liquidated the McMansions, well, you get a fraction of your money back. So that's a corporate bankruptcy. Individual bankruptcy. You go to the bank. You say, hi, I'm Tina and Chaz, and we're the most swipple white people ever white swippled, and she has her master's degree in poetry, and I have an MBA. We're just so cool, and we borrow money for everything, our clothes, the furniture, our children, our cars, the both Range Rover, and my Beamer. You know you got to keep up appearances, and we just have to, at the age of 27, live in the richest neighborhood with the best schools, because little Jimmy can't go to regular school with the black kids. No, no, no. Uh, and we need like the nicest McMansion ever so that people know we are the hot shit. And they come knock, knock, knock over at Aaron's office again. I ran into Jim, the real estate developer douchebag. I've also ran into untold number of dude bro and dude broette assholes who I have seen since and it's good to see them poor. Anyway. <clears throat> All right. We will... We will lend you the money, but uh, we are going to get in return a mortgage. The bank will hold the mortgage. That is our bond. It is a very big bond. It's not $100 per share. It is $500,000 for this one share, for this one bond. And the collateral is the house again. <laughs> oh, imagine that. Chaz, douchebag Mickey, frat boy moron, his sales job went belly up. Who knew that would happen because his boss was also a douchebag frat boy and didn't pay his taxes, and now he's trying to hide the money from the IRS. <laughs> and he's just split town, you know. And then Tina, with her master's in poetry, she she, she don't know debt from equity spending because she's a moron, but she has big tits, so that's all that matters. They can't make the payment uh, on their car, their house, everything. So we go and we repossess the McMansion and the cars and the Range Rover. What happened to, to market prices of houses and Range Rovers and all that? Because all the Tina and, and Chazes were getting repossessed on. And so the bank goes and repossesses on a $500,000 McMansion, $200,000 cars. We're supposed to be able to turn around the market and sell them for $700,000. No, what do we get? Because Americans are stupid, court, uh, spoiled suburbanite douchebags. We only get $300,000. So we lent out, what, seven? We got back three. Bank takes a $400,000 loss. All right, so that's an individual defaulting. Then there's governments, okay? Uh, Argentina. Uh, if you don't, if you haven't been to Argentina, there's a lot of mirrors in Argentina because all they do is they look at each other and admire, not each other, they look at themselves and admire themselves in the mirror like, oh my God, que paso Pablo, estoy un argentino. Oh, que pasa este bon me llamas, Tina, oh douchebag it. And I look at myself in the mirror and I watch Spanish soap operas, we are so good because we are Argentinians. And what they thought is, hey, let's just borrow a shit ton of money and piss away on social programs. Greece did this. Mexico did this. A lot of European countries did this. They just piss away all their money because we'll just give our money to poor non-working people. That'll work. That'll give us a rate. And uh, all the other countries that lend us money through the IMF, United States, or individual investors, institutional investors through investment banks, we'll tell them we'll pay them 7%. And while we're looking at ourselves and masturbating to ourselves in the mirror because we are Argentinians, we won't work jack fuck all shit and we won't work up the money to pay off those debts. <clears throat> so, also in Argentina's, what was it? <sighs> was it Elliot Nestor Kirchner? It was the husband of the wife who also then defaulted on loans. This is 1999. I have to look up my Argentinian history. Surprise, surprise, this socialist shithole country doesn't work up the economic production to pay off the billions of dollars that the world lent them. 
what do you do? Well, there should be collateral. In the olden days, you had gunboat diplomacy, where we'd send in the, you know, Teddy Roosevelt would send over the U.S. Navy and say, oh yeah, <laughs> you're not going to pay us? You ain't getting no food, sons of bitches. By the way, we like those islands, and we like that oil, and we like this. You're going to pay us. Now, you're just screwed, because unless you're going to declare war, you're not going to get your money back. And uh, so this is more commonly what you find when you lend to foreign governments, or governments in general, is uh, since they don't really have productive assets, unless they're communists or socialists, then they do have productive assets, but they'll never pay you. And, and since they don't live under your legal system, there's no court, as an international court, but it doesn't have no teeth. Uh, they could just go, we got your money. And that's what they do, and oftentimes consciously. For example, Greece. You are a fucking moron to lend money to Greece. The government of Chad, there was some oil exploration company that actually agreed to lend the government of Chad. Not my buddy Chad. Remember that really shitty country next to Sudan in you know, kind of Central Africa? They actually lent that country money. Income per capita of around $600. I think second to last place in the Human Development Index. They lent this government a, a billion dollars. All right? I don't know what you fucking people are thinking. I don't, and I don't understand letting go. So I think there's a little bit of hanky-panky or some, some scam or racket going on when it comes to sovereign or government lending or lending money to other governments. Uh, but for the most part, because they're sovereign nations, unless you're going to ship over an army, uh, they're just going to tell their foreign investors anyway to screw off. Right? And in that case, the bonds go down to nothing. However, in the case of all these defaults, Right? There is a chance sometimes for profit. And this is where bonds become very interesting. Right? When it comes to Greece and the communist parasites that live over there, all right, so saying, no, we're not paying any of you, <clears throat> or Argentina, where our government just says, no, we're not going to pay you, we dare you to invade us. There's not much you can get. Those bonds are zero. You're not going to see anything of it ever again. Their economies might go to pot later, but you're never going to see that money again. But getting back to this corporate raider thing, uh, Sometimes what the company is telling you, not that they're lying, it looks like such bad news that not only does the stock go down to zero, but now you're playing the game, all right, well, they're not going to run the company anymore. Uh, we can sell this company off as a whole. What can we get? So investment bankers come in there, do some kind of analysis. We can sell off the assets individually. Some people, asset valuation specialists go in there and value the assets, but then some people are a little bit better than others, or some people have better connections with buyers. And this is where that whole corporate raider thing came in. <clears throat> you had incompetent fucks. I know you guys all hate Mitt Romney or whatever the, the company was. Was it Blackwater? Not Blackwater. Blackstone? You guys all hate this company that, that came in, oh, they took our jobs. No, your management and the original owners of the company drove it into the ground that these people could come in, buy the equity for pennies, own it, say, all right, liquidate the assets, and then sell off the company bit by bit or to a foreign investor or whatever, not foreign and foreign country, but another investor. And they made, you know, made the bondholders whole, so the bondholders got their principal back, and they were left over with one, two, three, five, ten billion. And you guys are all pissed off over jobs that were going to be destroyed anyway. It's just that these guys got in there a little bit savvier and smarter than you. So this presents a very interesting opportunity for bonds. Bonds are normally very boring. You invest in bonds because they're fixed income. You just get your, you get your regular semi-annual check. <clears throat> it's always 3% or 5%. It's usually a very low-risk, high-quality borrower, IBM, United States government. They can just print off more money if they want. And, and it's ho-hum. You know, Grandma Tilly, when she's 80, she should probably have a near 100% low-risk, high-quality bond portfolio. She makes her 4% a year, pays for her, her groceries and her property taxes, and she's good to go. But where bonds get interesting is when they start going into, you know, trading below par, when they go, when the company or the borrower becomes insolvent, because then there's a chance for the bond market to overreact and bonds go down more than what the assets will be sold for than what that company could be sold for. And since the bondholders get paid first, and if there's any money left over, the equity holders get paid second, you could make money on bonds. There is an opportunity to make a lot of money on bonds. So now this goes beyond me, because I'm not an asset valuation specialist. Uh, and I would certainly not buy 
bankrupt bonds of Latin American countries, you are a fuck, or Greece, any socialist shithole, just don't do business with them, very simple principle, don't have sex with girls that have herpes or bipolar and or, and don't invest in uh, Latin American communist countries, pretty simple idea, but if a railroad company all of a sudden says they're going out of business, and the bonds are trading at 40 cents on the dollar, but you you start looking and you, you've worked the railroad like, dude, those locomotives are at least worth 2.5 million, whatever locomotives are, and the engines are worth, <clears throat> you know, 5 million, and those rail rights are, I think this is way priced below what could happen. You know what's great about bankrupt companies? Their stocks trade at zero or near zero. So you go in with half a million dollars, buy all the shares of, let's just say it's BNSF, it's not, but let's just say it's BNFF. Now, you control it before the creditors take over the, the lenders, and you say, hey, I know right now the market's saying you're only gonna get 35%. What if I could get you 40, 45%, but I want 2% for myself? Or say, you know what, I know the market right now says you're only gonna get 40%. But what if I can get you 70%? I want 5%. Or I know the the market's going to get it. Right now, the market says you're only going to collect 42 cents on the dollars. I could get you all your money back, but you got to let me keep the rest of it. Who could what? And that's, well, that's what ends up happening when you own the equity of the company. And then the creditor's like, shit, you can make us whole? Go ahead. New CEO. Go, 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 Mitt. Go, Mitt. It's your birthday. Happy birthday. He's an evil white man. A dick keeps. No, you're just a fucking moron hick who doesn't understand finance. We ain't learned like you people go to Harvard MBA school. No, but you should be able to learn some basic accounting. Figure it out. So that's where bonds can get very interesting. Now, take like I said, it's high, that's where it becomes high risk. It's not this good quality borrower anymore. You're betting on whether or not assets of these uh, companies are going to pay or bring in more in terms of sales than what the bonds are currently trading for in the market. Um, but that's, or you can buy the bonds too, I guess. You could buy the bonds. That's another thing. You buy the bonds. Uh, and then they go up in value too. So um, anyway, that's how bonds can get very interesting. So if you think that uh, the asset prices, uh, the the book value, the assets, the the inevitable sales price of the company's assets will bring in more than a bonds. You can buy the bonds. You can, if the if the equity is trading on the penny stock uh, exchange OTC, buy up the equity, and then go and liquidate it and make your money. All right. But since you're not a corporate raider, chances are if you think oh, I think they're going to get more than forty cents on the dollar and Think you got some good analysis? Okay, buy some bonds. Go buy some bonds and, oh, hey, I get 50 cents on the dollar. The price of your bond goes up. All right. So that is kind of how bonds work. Now, you start asking some questions about what is this type of bond? What is that type of there are There are hundreds, thousands of different types of bonds. And, and some of which I guarantee you, I have never, I'd never heard of the structure. No, I probably did sometime in the past. I'm like, oh, God, damn, what, what the fuck is this thing? So I'm going to go through your question. Okay. What is a structured note? Okay, a structured note is so misleading. A structured note is really two investments in one. It's like, a, it's more like a mutual fund that has two components, you know, just two individual securities. Usually mutual funds have, you know, 50, 100 different individual stocks and bonds within it. Uh, but a structured note is just basically, well, a sort of and a not so sort of simplified mutual fund. You have a debt component, a bond component, where you are lending money to a borrower and they're gonna pay you agreed upon, you know, interest rate and term and maturity and all that. <clears throat> and then there is a derivative component that in some way or another hedges against the risk, provides you some uh, rate of return beyond what the modicum of interest that the, the bond component of this structured note pays. And so it's kind of a way to diversify, um, and it all depends on what the bond component is. What it's, is it? Are you lending to Argentina again? Because you're a fucking moron. Well, heaven help you. And then um, the the derivative or the secondary aspect of it would be okay. Well, we're going to invest in a currency hedge against the Argentina peso, Argentinian peso. Sometimes it hedges against it. Sometimes it doesn't. So oh, now we're now we're going to invest in a silver mine. And in, in Chile, mm -hmm. yeah, 
It could be anywhere. Uh, for you, I'm going to assume since you're new to bonds, I would not be investing in these. These are way beyond your, your concern. And here's the other thing. They're usually not open to average schmucks like you and me. And the reason why is because now we've combined two things together that nobody really wants unless you're a very specialized investor. You got a bond component. Okay, cool. Now I got this weirdo beta orbiter circling around it, weird ass moon going around Jupiter. What the fuck is it? I don't know. It, it, it's investing in what? Methane? Cow methane farms? What? I don't know what. Uh, how many people want that unique combination of this debt product and this derivative product? Well, that's a very small market, so it's not liquid and you just can't unload it on, this, on the market. You're not going to be trading in this. You're just not. So I would not be worried about these at all. All right? Uh, it's just not going to be your cup of tea. All right. A strip bond or a stripped bond. A strip, a bond, let's just take our classic example of a bond. All it is is principal pay, I'm sorry, interest payments, coupon payments, and a principal payment at the end. And what a strip bond, stripping is kind of the wrong word. It's called breaking those payments apart bond. That's really what it is. <clears throat> and you, so you got a payment this month, a payment six months later, six months later, six months later, six months later for up to 30 years on a 30-year mortgage or 30-year bond. And then you got a principal payment at the end. Or you have five years of semi-annual interest payments and a principal payment at the end of that. What stripping does is it breaks apart all those payments and sells them off individually as an individual bond. So your principal payment at the end of five years, that's now its own separate bond. This interest payment on the third year, second semi-annual payment, that's now a separate bond. The third year, first one, separate, separate, separate. So you sell them off individually and now they essentially become, oh, essentially, they are now zero coupon bonds. They don't have interest payments associated with them anymore. These are now just payments at a specific point in time uh, for a specific amount. And it still is paid by the original uh, borrower, so the risk still is the same, but now they trade independent of one another because they're separate individual securities. Right? So that is, so... Now, it's a slightly different than a U.S. government savings bond where you're like, okay, pay my 20 bucks and I get my interest in principal at the end of it. That's a zero coupon bond. But this, these payments were all at one point in time part of the same bond. And they still get the money coming from the original borrower who has to pay it back. But the third payment, I'm sorry, the second payment of the second year might be owned by Steve because he wanted a two-year payment out. And the fourth your second semi-annual payment might be owned by Bob because Bob didn't want a two-year, he wanted a four-year. And then these can also be traded amongst one another and thrown into other groupings of strip bonds and components and all that for the sake of diversification. Now, this is, goes to your third question. What is a strip bond package or package strip bonds? Package strip bonds is where you take that payment here from that bond and that one there today and you create yourself essentially a mutual fund of various stripped bonds. Various coupon payments or interest payments from there over there. Oh, here's a, a principal payment. We want that big one there at that time. And various analysts and hedge fund people will use this because they want to put together a mutual fund or a hedge fund and to lower the risks through boring mathematics and Maslow's, not Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, Markowitz's efficient frontier theory. I won't get into it. You can lower your risk. You got an extra rate of return. If you're dealing with billions of dollars, you make a little bit of money and you buy a yacht in Connecticut. And that's Wall Street. Um, so that is all that a strip bond package is. <clears throat> Should you get into strip bonds and strip bond packages? No. I can see a strip bond if you're looking at, again, you're, you're, I think you're from Canada. I don't know if Canada has like this series double E savings bond. You want a savings bond? Yay. Okay. You could get that for your kid to teach him a little bit of stuff. But a strip bond package or strip bonds? No. You know what? Buy a mutual fund of bonds. You get diversification, you get your interest, you get principal, um, you get, uh, what else? You, you, you can go high risk, low risk. <clears throat> you can get junk bond uh, mutual funds where it's like trading at cents on the dollars and maybe somebody bails them out and the, the bondholders are made whole. So there's that. All right, now you ask another question. And this is going to take a little bit and this is where I talked about the difference between the coupon rate or your interest rate and then the yield to maturity. Say, so what is yield to maturity? All right. 
you go and you buy your bond day one that it's issued directly, directly from the investment bank. You spend your $10,000, let's just use your example here, <clears throat> and uh, you are paying, Bell Canada borrows from you essentially $10,000 and they agree to pay you per year 3.35%. Per, uh, All right, so you, you're going to get 3.35%, assuming Bell Canada doesn't go bankrupt or anything, and they pay regularly. You will realize a 3.35% per year rate of return on that bond. Now, this is, if it's maturing in 2023, I'd have to look it up. But let's just, for the sake of you, say this is a 20-year bond, so that would have made it issued in 20. 2003. All right, let's just say it's a 20 year bond. I know it probably is, but let's just say it is. All right, 20 year bond. Well, the second you buy it, and you're not the only one that bought these bonds, other people have bought these bonds, and a lot of them are now immediately turning around and selling them on the market. Why do they want to sell them on the market? Well, they think there's a profit potential, they want to go and raise some money in other ways, or more likely, economic conditions have changed and uh, financial conditions have changed at Bell Canada or the Canadian economy has changed. Nothing remains static. So as, and it's, it's literally to the second, the second these bonds are issued, and they're starting to be sold on the secondary market, the price will change from the original par value of $10,000. Why? <clears throat> because no matter how minuscule or minute or large or obvious, risk changes. The risk that Bell Canada does or does not pay you back Sometimes the risk is lessened. Oh, Bell Canada got a new contract. Holy cow, they, oh, really good. The subscribership is up. Oh, now Bell Canada's a little less risky. Oh, crap, you guys, in, you guys elected the world's douchiest, most pathetic trust fund baby ever. Holy shit, the world's going to hell. Well, Canada's going to hell. You guys, you know, Trump, we're all right, but you guys are going to go to hell. <laughs> the risk that Bell Canada is not going to pay us off has gone much higher. And what ends up happening, uh, not necessarily specific to Bell Canada, but to bonds of equivalent maturity, and this is going to be hard to explain, but I'll explain because professors never do this, <clears throat> but let's say equivalent risk. Uh, Ten years go by, the risk in the market associated with this bond has changed. The risk associated in this market with bonds of equivalent maturity and interest rates have changed because Bell Canada is not the only one that borrowed money, $10,000 at 3.35%. Other entities with a triple B rating also borrowed, maybe not exactly at that day, <clears throat> but at that time. And the going market rate for a 20-year bond of a triple B rating, a rate of return, the risk priced into it says, okay, all right, there's an outside chance you might not pay us back. Very unlikely, but there's a chance. Plus, I want a rate of return for waiting 20 years to get my money back. Everyone in the market agrees for a 20-year bond, the coupon rate would be 3.35%. Uh, Ten years go by. Now it would be 2013. Here's the trick to understanding why the yield to maturity and the coupon bond, or coupon rate, the, the stated rate, 3.35% rate, are different now. Do you still hold a 20-year bond? And the answer is no. What you hold now is a 10-year bond of which the yield curves and the risk, uh, the risk associated with a 10-year bond is different than those associated with 20-year bond. A lot more can happen in 20 years. You have twice the amount of time, so twice the amount of time uh, risk in time. Uh, but with 10 years, that's a little bit short. There's still some risk there. But what you hold, even though you may have bought it 10 years ago and you're one of the original investors and holders of this bond, you have not sold it. You still have, still get your 3.35%. <clears throat> you now hold a 10-year bond. And because economic and risk factors change in the economy constantly, the interest rate paid on other 10-year bonds of triple B ratings might be different. And so this is why the price and the yield to maturity on your bond, even though set in stone, uh, and it is set in stone, you still get your 3.35%, but the price of your bond will change and the yield to maturity will change. And what do you have to understand is that you can't look at your bond as something that you're holding on to. You have to look at your bond and say, what else can I get in the market that's a 10-year uh, bond? If I can get someone to pay 5% for 
for ten year for a ten year bond. Why am I lending to Bell Canada for three point three five percent? So view it more in this way. Ten years pass, or five years. Now it's a fifteen year bond. It's ten years. It's a ten year bond. Fifteen years pass. Now you have a five year bond. Nobody cares when it was issued. You functionally have a 10-year bond. 10 years of interest payments with a, a principal payment at the end. So now your bond is in competition with other bonds of equivalent risk uh, and equivalent maturity. 10 years. And if all of a sudden, let's say I'm trying to think of something that would be simple. You got, let's, let's use the real example here. Your, your yield is, is lower. Let's say 3.35%, that's the interest rate you get. Now the going rate for a 10-year bond is only 2% because of lower risk or whatever. The economy is growing more. People are more willing to lend 10 years out than they were beforehand. <clears throat> so you got a bond that pays 3.35% while the market is only paying 2% for a bond that is also a 10-year bond of equivalent risk. Well, what's going to happen to the price of your bond? Okay, well, the price of your bond is going to go up. People are going to say, look, uh, Jason has a bond that pays 3.35%, and right now I can only get 2% lending my money out to an equivalent risk uh, company like Bell Canada. Hey, Jason, how much do you want for your bond? Now, you are making 1.35% more than the market. Are you going to sell it at $1,000, but not the $1,000, the, the $1,000 and the interest that is accrued to you? No, you gotta, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why would I sell you this bond that pays a higher interest rate for par value? I want you to compensate me for the extra print, uh, I'm sorry, the extra interest rate that my bond is paying over the market. And that's why in this particular case, you, you'll notice that your coupon rate is 3.35%. The yield to maturity is 2.8%. Uh, that's more or less the market rate. So your price is higher. That's why you, your price is 102 and not not 100 or, or 10,200 and, and not uh, 10,000 because you have a higher interest rate paying bond on your hand. The reverse can happen. Let's say, um, you know, uh, you got your 3.35%. All of a sudden, I don't know, just your studio, something, some the more risk, the economy slows, something's going bad, something's happening in the economy. Now to lend out 10, 10 years, oh, whoa, wait a minute, I... I want 5%. No one's going to lend out at 3.35. No, Bell Canada, you're going to pay. You're going to, you know what? You're going to pay 6%. For 10 years, I want 6%. And now you got your bond. You're sitting here on your bond. It only pays 3.35%. How are you going to sell your bond? No one wants to buy your stinky, crappy 3.35% bond. That's less than the 6% they can get in the market. So what do you got to do? You got to discount your bond. And you got to lower the price of your bond so that it's an equivalent rate of return of 6%. So what you see is to the penny is the value of your bond will rise so that it pays the same percentage, uh, the same yield that a 10-year treasury on a treasury, 10-year bond is paying <clears throat> in the case that the market interest rate is lower than what your bond pays. Or your price of your bond has to go down so that the interest rate is equivalent to the market rate, in this case 6%. So you'd have to, I'd have to do the math, but 3.3, 10%. I don't know. Your bond would go down by like, you know, say it'll go down to maybe $94 per share. Because those people are like, hey, hey, you got to make the price cheap enough to worth it so that I'm getting what I can get in the market, effectively speaking. Right. So <clears throat> that's the difference between your coupon rate and the yield to maturity. The yield to maturity is simply what is the going interest rate of a bond of your maturity and your risk. Because that's also key. You, the, 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 the length of the time left in the bond, 10-year, or in this case, what is it? Yeah, almost to this date, the 20... Yeah, look at it. You're almost to... You, you have effect, effectively to the year. March 22nd is this maturity five years out. So you are holding on to a five-year bond right now. I guarantee you if you go into the market and you start looking at triple B-rated bonds, corporate, uh, that have a five-year maturity, you're going to see them, if they're issuing brand new, issuing brand new, they're going to be darn close to 2.8% because that's the going market rate for a 5% bond or five-year bond right now. You have a five-year bond that pays a little bit more than 2.8%. Than you have one that pays 3.35%. And that's why your bond is trading at $102, a little bit more than par because it has a little bit more value. So that, that is yield. Yield is nothing more than what are bonds, interest rates 
for this maturity, 5, 10, 15 years, can be 7, 9 years, whatever, <clears throat> and this risk rating, triple B, triple A, double AB, whatever else. So hopefully that explains yield to maturity. Um, if the bond, final question, if the bond is held to maturity, does it matter if the price goes down? If not, um, Okay, if the bond, hang on, let me go, that was my notes, let me just read your question. If you plan to hold the bond to maturity, does it matter if the prices go down? As long as it doesn't default, you will get the par value. Is that, is that correct? Yes, that is correct as long as it doesn't go into default. <clears throat> the real issue is that uh, you will not be getting an interest rate that is equivalent to what's being paid in the market. All right. Uh, so, and again... In your case, you don't want the market interest rate. You want to hold on to your bond because it pays 3.35%. Uh, if the market rate goes above your current 3.35%, well, then you're like, oh, I'm only getting a lousy 3.35%. I should sell my bonds. The problem is the market's already adjusted for that, so you're not going to get that rate of return. <laughs> but any new money you might want to invest in the market, you're not going to further lend it to Bell Canada. You're going to buy into a 6% a bond uh, for five years. Uh, but no, as long as you're happy with the interest rate you're getting, and, and a lot of people are, they're not, they're not looking to, you know, flashing cash, wham and bam, thank you ma'am. They just want the 3.35%. And so if you're okay with the interest rate you're getting, um, and uh, it doesn't go default, yes, you get your, your uh, principal back, and they will pay you that 3.35%. It may be of concern to you if like in inflation goes hyperinflation 17% or whatever. Well, yeah, then your bond, yeah, you'll get your $10,000, but it'll be inflated away. Um, but assuming no major inflation or anything like that, yes, if you're happy with the interest rate you're getting, you don't have to go and liquidate it. And on top of it, it's pretty much impossible because the market's already moving quick enough that if you want to sell your bonds, they're going to be sold at a lower price, effectively getting you uh, the same rate of return that you're getting anyway. So there's that. All right. I hope that explained bonds. I hope you guys are all very excited about the world of bonds. I'm not. <laughs> uh, I'm more interested in cryptocurrency and uh, waiting for the stock market to crash before I go and buy up anything more. And that's about it. If you guys have questions, the captain has answers. A lot of them may take a little while. Over at assholeconsulting.com. <clears throat> um, what else? If you... Don't have any use for my services. You want to give me money anyway, you can do that at patreon.com slash Aaron Clary. You can check out my books over at amazon.com, Bachelor Pad Economics, Curse of the High IQ, Poor Richard's Retirement. That's a good one. That's germane to the topic of this conversation. And check out the Clary Podcast on SoundCloud, C-L-A-R-E-Y. We'll see you guys later. Toodles.